Do you see my slide? Yes. Yes, you hear me well? Yes. Okay, very good. So good afternoon, everybody. It is a pleasure to be back today to continue a little bit with the thermodynamic description of topological insulators. So uh, before yesterday, we were looking at the most common models studied, and we have seen that we could describe topological phase transitions as a thermodynamic phase transition. And today we are going to concentrate on two other examples, which are a bit more intricate. One are higher order topological insulators and no Hermitian topological insulators. Okay, so just to recall very fast what we talked about on Wednesday, we said that the field of topological insulators has been developing based on classifications, based on dimension and symmetries. And out of that, we could predict how should be the, the topological invariant for each topological phase in different dimensions. And we wanted to take a completely different approach and try to understand whether we could do the same and predict these topological phase transitions using a thermodynamic approach. We had two problems. One is that the system is finite. So what is the meaning of thermodynamic limit? And because of that, we were inspired by the so-called Hill nanothermodynamics that allows us to treat finite size systems. And today, as I said, uh, we are going to generalize the things we did from Hermitian systems to the non-Hermitian non case. You, oops, why it's not going. So if you remember the second problem that we had, besides the fact that uh, our systems had boundaries and everything interesting is happening at the boundaries, so we couldn't go completely into the thermodynamic limit, there was another problem when we try to describe topological phase transitions, is that at these phase transitions, there is no symmetry breaking, so we can't apply anything like Ginzburg-Landau formalism, and that, um, we have a, a completely delocalized uh, order parameter. But as you recall, the air and fast classification is two holes, and I have shown to you that we can describe them using that. And the air and fast classification is nothing but looking at the nth derivative of the Gibbs free energy, first, second, third, and so on and looking which is the number of the derivative that shows a discontinuity or a divergence. And that number decides the order of the phase transition that we are going to have. So today we will now do the same for the Hotchis and for the non-Hermitian TIs, as simple as possible, just to illustrate the problem. So just to recall, I think you have been learning what higher order topological insulators are. These are the Hotchis. The usual topological insulators have a bulk in G dimensions and they will show topological properties at the edge that has dimension D minus one. On the other hand, these higher order topological insulators, they have a bulk in D dimensions and they will show topological properties that appear in dimensions which are smaller than d minus one, at least d minus two. So simple examples would be that, for instance, in two dimensions, as you see here in G, instead of having the edge modes that are one dimensional as in C, where you have in a chaired insulator, you would have corner modes, characteristic of a quadrupolar order. And in three dimensions, you could have either one dimensional hinge states or you could have corner modes again. So it has to be G minus two. These models were proposed by Ben Alcazar, Bernadig, and Taylor Hughes in 2017. And that's the model that we are going to use today. These models have been observed in many, experimentally in many different systems in bismuth and in metamaterials, some of them made with photonic systems. You can see here some Kagome lattices, but also in electronic systems, we did it in 2019, uh, uh, an artificial 
um, electronic quantum simulator where we could see the, the corner modes. So these systems didn't have uh, all the features of the original uh, BBH model, but they have lower dimensional corner modes in a two dimensional lattice, Gener generic in that sense. Okay, so let's then now concentrate on the paradigmatic model for uh, HOTI, which is the BBH model, which now consists of a two dimensional lattice with the hopping parameters gamma x and lambda x, so like the 1G SSH model, with the difference is that now along the vertical direction, I don't get gamma y and gamma y, but here it's minus gamma y, which means that there is a flux piercing my plaquette, okay? So this inversion of the hopping parameter, it's something that is not very obvious to realize experimentally because you need a flux but it's possible to do. And then it's simply a model with alternating hopping in the x direction, gamma x, lambda x, and in the y direction, minus gamma y, minus lambda y, but this becomes positive in the next vertical. Okay, that is then the Hamiltonian of the model, a simple tight binding Hamiltonian. And it was shown uh, in this paper that this uh, model has very interesting phases. If I look at a phase diagram in terms of gamma y over lambda y versus gamma x over lambda x, and these phases are characterized by the polarization, which is now a vector px, py, and we are going to have many different phases. So one where the polarization vector, Px and Py, are both zero. So we are combining the plaquettes in that way. And this is then the trivial phase, which is represented here by the, the red dot. There is then another phase in which I will get here a, a dipolar, uh, but just for one of the, the Py, let's say, and not for the Px. So my, uh, my quantum number here, my topological invariant is one half and zero. This is the so-called dipolar phase and the, the plaquettes are closed along the other direction. But we could also then have another phase which is the quadrupolar phase, phase where we have a corner mode completely isolated in the x and directions. And here you can see your, your corner mode uh, in, this, in this plot. So this is a very rich phase diagram with now three different phases, not just a trivial and dipolar or trivial and quadrupolar, quadrupolar, but with all the three. And the question now that I would like to address is, am I able to describe these topological phase transitions in this more complex system also using the thermodynamic description? Okay. So let's first concentrate uh, in the simplest case, which is along the diagonal when gamma x is equal to gamma y. And then, so gamma x over lambda x is equal to gamma y over lambda y, and we'll call this just gamma. And in this case, we are just looking at the transition between the quadrupolar and the trivial phase. Very good. Let me then... Uh, uh, just recall with you how is the energy spectrum as a function of gamma for gamma x equal gamma y. And we see that we have here a zero mode between minus one and one, which means when I am in the quadrupolar phase and just a gap opening for the trivial phase and nothing else. And this quadrupolar phase, you can see here when you have the, the px and the py converging to give me the red and the blue corner modes. These are these protected modes. So before we do the calculations for this case, let me recall briefly with you what I explained on Wednesday, when we try to do a thermodynamic description of topological systems for which we have a Hamiltonian, we are going to do two things. One is to determine the grand potential given by the log of the trace of H minus beta H minus mu n, that's the usual thermodynamic relation. And then we are doing these ansatz that our ground potential can be separated into two parts. And this is inspired on Hill thermodynamics. 
that was possible because we did not assume all the quantities to be extensive. And then we can have one term that is extensive, which is the bulk term times the volume, and another term that's non extensive, like the surface times the area, for instance. And in one dimension, this would simplify that my bulk is multiplied by the length, and the non extensive part would be just the corner that does not depend on the length scale, right? And uh, if we look now at the quantum phase transition itself, this is going to be complementary to the notion of topological invariance. So one of the examples that's going to be useful also to compare later with the non Hermitian case is the SSH model. I have a one dimensional chain with a hop in T and T2. And now uh, I am going to look at the phase diagram energy, sorry, first at the spectrum energy versus T in unities of T2. And I will see that for T smaller than T2, from between modulus of T smaller than T2, between minus one and one, I have uh, um, a zero mode here at the boundaries and for T over T2 larger than one, I don't. So there is a transition from a topological to a trivial phase, right? And when I now do the calculations, either by uh, solving the problem for several length scales and separating the extensive part of the free energy from the no extensive part. So this is the boundary, this is the bulk. I can now start in taking derivatives according to the area and fast classification. And I will immediately see that the no extensive part, which means the boundary is going to have a phase transition because it has a discontinuity precisely when T is equal to T2. It's the first order phase transition is the first derivative Whereas for the bulk, which is in red, I am going to have a second order phase transition precisely at the same point. It's the same point where we knew that the, the topological invariant was changing. So both phase transitions at the bulk and at the edge, they occur at the same point, but they have different orders, okay? So this is a discontinuous and this is a continuous phase transition. That's what we have seen uh, last Wednesday. We understood also this in terms of the Josephson hyperscaling relation that tells me that the order of a quantum phase transition is connected to critical exponents nu and z. And this is the co-dimension of my system, g. And these exponents nu and z are determined when I look at how my gap closes as a function of two parameters. One is the external parameter that I'm tuning to drive my phase transition. Here is the hopping, but it could be anything else. So how far I am from the critical hopping parameter at which I have the phase transition. And P is just how far I am from the critical momentum at which I drive the phase transition. So if I look at how my gap closes for the parameter equal to zero as a function of momentum, this exponent tells me this critical exponent z. And if I look how the gap closes as a function of this g parameter at zero momentum, I will get that this is nu z. And since I have z from here, I can get nu from there. And what we have seen then, it's for the SSH model for the Kita F chain in one dimension, both. For the two-dimensional models, Kenny Milley and BHZ, and for the BHZ in three dimensions, all these systems belong to the same universality class. They all had nu equal one, z equal one, and the, the order of the, the phase transition is always the co-dimension plus one. And uh, one can then show that this, they belong to the Dirac universality class. That's what uh, Rodrigo Aruca has shown this year. So I, did, I mentioned it, but I didn't show you. And this was an example for the Kitaev chain that we could use these topological states to build, for instance, a heat engine. And then I would have the, the best uh, rendement for my uh, heat engine if I would operate my system close to the phase transition. That's the best point 
and I would have my edge and my bulk behaving differently. One would be like a refrigerator, the other would be like a heater. This uh, has been published in collaboration with a group of uh, Özgür, Mr. Caprioglu, this last year. Okay, so now I want to go and look at the hotches because this is now a more complex system where I would look, for instance, uh, uh, into dimensions, I don't have only the bulk that is scaling with the area. I also have the edge that is scaling with the length, but I have the corner that is scaling without any dimension, right? So now the question is, could I try to describe using the same uh, uh, approach, this kind of systems? So we have seen that we could do this in two ways, either by uh, using the Hamiltonian, calculating the grand potential and doing a scaling relation. This was one possibility to separate these contributions, but we could also use correlation functions. And I have shown you that if we use correlation functions and look directly at derivatives of omega with respect to any parameter, I would do a much faster job by calculating correlation functions. So that's what we are going to do here because this is really a, a regime when this would be very costly to do this scaling approach. So now let's do them since we were first looking at this phase transition from the trivial to the quadrupolar phase when gamma x equal gamma y is equal to y. We will then use the Hamiltonian. We will need to calculate all these correlation functions to calculate how is the derivative of my free energy at zero temperature with respect to some parameter that I'm tuning. And when we do that, we will now use uh, the same kind of uh, uh, um, approach that we used before, but now it is slightly more intricate. Because suppose that I want to calculate the variation of the omega at the edge. So I want to get the red and the blue parts. Before, since I had only edge and bulk, I could calculate the problem for periodic boundary conditions on the torus that I had then, the system for the bulk, and I would subtract the closed, uh, the, the open surface from that, I would immediately get the edge. But now I also have corners. So the problem is a bit more complicated. So if I would like to get the edge, what I will do is I will calculate the problem when I have periodic boundary conditions only in Y, plus the problem when I have periodic boundary conditions only in X. And now I have to subtract one bulk to have just the edge here. But here I have been edging uh, 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 adding the two bulks. So I have to subtract these two bulks that I added here. So twice the calculations on the torus to be able to get just the remaining blue and red parts. And if I am going to calculate how the corner behaves, the derivative of the corner with respect to some tuning parameter, now I want the dots. So to get the dots, I have to start by solving the problem for an open configuration in 2D. Now I have to get rid of the two red. So I have to subtract the system with a partially open periodic in one direction, boundary conditions. I have to subtract the two blue. I have to take periodic conditions now along the X direction. But now look, I had one bulk, I subtracted one bulk, but I still subtracted another bulk while doing this one. So I have to add one more full bulk to get rid completely of the bulk and get only the four dots there. So we are then going to calculate these correlation functions for all these configurations. And we look first at the spectrum for these configurations here. And what we see is that when I have an open boundary condition, I am seeing the closure of the gap and these zero modes in this regime between minus one and one. When I have the torus, I close the gap, but I don't have the zero modes because the system is periodic. And I can also close the gap when I have partially periodic boundary conditions. 
So this is solved by gamma x equal gamma y equal to gamma when I am along that diagonal in the phase diagram. And if I now do my calculations by taking the thermodynamic potential omega and taking the derivatives with respect to gamma, that is equal to gamma x and gamma y, I will then see that I am plotting in different corners Omega corner is in green, omega edge is in yellow, omega bulk is in blue. And now I take first, second, and third derivatives, and I immediately see that the corner has a spike for the first derivative. The edge has a spike. You see here, there is no spike. The edge has a spike in the second derivative, and the bulk has a spike in the third derivative. So this gives me precisely the same thing I had before. I can go now and look at how the, the, the gap is closing. And I'm going to find that Z is 1, mu is 1. And the transition between the trivial and quadrupolar phases belongs to the same Dirac universality class with the same critical exponents as before. OK? easy and nice, but in addition to that phase transition from the quadrupolar to the trivial phase, so where we went along this line where the symmetries were preserved, I can also have other topological phase transitions. For instance, this one in blue from the dipolar to the quadrupolar phase, or this one in green from the trivial to the dipolar phase. Is this thermodynamic description of topological phase transitions going to hold also here or not? Let's now see what happens if I repeat the same procedure. The only difference is that along the red line, I had gamma x equal gamma y equal to gamma. And now here, I will plot for the blue one, I will use gamma x equal to 0 0.5, and I will plot things as a function of gamma y. That's now my x-axis here. And for the green one, I will again have gamma x equal to 1.5, because this was 1. This point is 1.5. This is 0 0.5. The 0 is at here at the center. So I will solve the problem for different values of gamma x, and I will plot it as a function of gamma y, OK? And now my color codes here means that red is this transition, blue is this transition, and green is this transition for different values of gamma x. And now I will plot only the, the, the parts which are the most interesting because you don't need to look at everything. But here I already see something quite different. So look first at the red ones, the quadrupolar to trivial, that one we have already analyzed. At the corner, I am going to see a peak at the first derivative. At the edge, I see a peak in the second derivative. At the bulk, I see a peak in the third, in the third derivative. That's what I have shown you in the previous slide. Everything is fine. But now, look at the blue, the transition from the dipolar to the quadrupolar. I see a discontinuity for the corner. I see a peak for the edge, so I am capturing the phase transition for the corner or for the edge, but for the bulk, I see nothing, just zero. I can't capture the phase transition at the bulk for this phase transition. And now look at that one between the trivial and the dipolar in green. For the corner, zero. For the edge, zero. For the bulk, zero. I cannot capture at all the transition from the trivial to the dipolar phase in terms of the thermodynamic variables. So what's going on? Could I interpret all the other phase transitions as quantum phase transitions, these topological phase transitions, and now not anymore? How is it? So let's look at the spectrum to try to understand what's going on. So when I look at the spectrum for the dipolar to the quadrupolar phase transition at gamma x equal to 0, 0.5, look at what I see. If I have 
the corners, I see the zero mode and I see a gap closing. If I have my cylinder and I plot on th things in terms of gamma y, I see a gap closing. Those were the two that I could describe in terms of the, the thermodynamics. But if I have a bulk, if I have a torus, so I'm looking at the bulk, there is no gap closing. So it looks like, and here also there is no gap closing in terms of gamma x. So it looks like that if I have no gap closing, I cannot see it with the thermodynamic variables. Look now at the transition from the trivial to the bipolar, nothing, no gap closing at all. So it is a completely different type of phase transition, doesn't occur due to a gap closing and the appearance of the zero modes, right? Because it's based on a different symmetry. These are these topological crystalline insulators. And then I am no longer able to capture with the thermodynamic formalism. But this was known from the work of Benal Kazar in 2017, that there, there, are, there is no gap closing for some types of boundary conditions. But in that work, he also gave us the solution, what we should do to understand all that. And the solution was to look at the so-called Vanier spectrum. Because in terms of the Vanier spectrum, there is always a gap closing. So what we will now look at this Vanier spectrum and see whether we can use it to do some thermodynamics. So in that way, we are going to define something which is called a Vanier grand potential. So if you take your Wilson loop, which is defined in terms of the, the, Hamil the Vanier Hamiltonian, and the Vanier Hamiltonian has eigenvalues which are the, these Vanier centers, I can now define my Vanier grand potential in terms of the sum of these Vanier centers which are below, smaller or equal than mu, where mu is now this Vanier chemical potential. And now for this Vanier grand potential, I can apply the same kind of approach where, because now this Vanier grand potential is something that is happening at the boundaries, okay? So since it's something happening at the boundaries, the bulk is now for a one dimensional system times the length and the edge is a zero dimensional system. And if now for this Vanier grand potential, I separate the part that it's extensive and non-extensive and I take derivatives, I will immediately see that the first derivative of the edge shows a discontinuity and the second of the bulk shows a discontinuity. The same for the blue, this is for the red transition when gamma x equal gamma y, so from the trivial to quadrupolar. I will see precisely the same for the dipolar to the quadrupolar, so the edge is first order and the bulk is second order, and I will see the same from the trivial to the dipolar when I am now at 1.5 for gamma x. So if I enlarge my definition of thermodynamic potential and I include the Vanier grand potential, I can again visualize the topological phase transitions and understand them in terms of quantum phase transitions because now the gap is closing for everybody. Okay, so very nice. It seems to work but I need to have some features in the spectrum such that I, I could use these definitions. Okay, I can now then come to my partial conclusions for the first part of the talk about the higher order topological insulators. So we can use a thermodynamic approach to characterize the quadrupolar to, to trivial phase transition. And if there is a gap closing, the topological quantum phase transitions uh, leads to this thermodynamic phase transition and this will respect the Josephson hyperscaling relations. But there are some transitions that are without any thermodynamical response. And to explore those, we have to use Wilson loops and the Vanier spectrum 
And then when I do that, I find that they are also in the Jirak universality class. And the main message from this part is to get higher order, use Vanier. I see that there is a question, please. Uh, should I read the question or is... Uh, yes, please, because we are streaming on YouTube. So like this, uh, they can hear it. Uh, okay, so I should read or do you read, uh, Maya? Uh, okay, I read it. How is this Vanilla Hamiltonian defined? Ah, I have it um, at the very end. Okay, uh, may I ask you to let it to the very end because it's my very last slide. So I come back to the question when I finish the talk, if you agree. Okay, it's defined in terms of the Wilson loop, but I can show you the calculations a bit more in detail, but it's my very last slide after the end of the talk. So I show you at the very end, if you allow me. Uh, is there any other question? Okay. No, so, that's it. Yes. So then uh, let me go to the second part of the talk uh, where now I would like to talk about the no Hermitian models. So until now, we had these topological phases that were in the universality class of the Dirac model. And what happens now if we go to these more complex no Hermitian models? So now it's very different because no Hermitian means that the Hamiltonian is different from the complex conjugate. And now my energies became complex. And it's such that my Hamiltonian applied on a certain state psi with a, what we call a, a right, it will have an eigenvalue, which is the energy E. But when I apply psi daga on the psi left, I will get my E star. So the system became much more complex. And what happens is that now psi right, psi right is no longer a delta, who is a delta MN now is the sandwich between the psi left and the psi right. So things can be cast into what we know, but we need to use this biorthogonal quantum mechanics where the states are now to the right and to the left, they are different states. When I have to calculate correlation functions or anything that means averaging, I need to use this type of uh, uh, left and right states. So uh, there is also one interesting thing because the, 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 the periodic and the, the, the bulk are very different. So, I am going to have a completely different spectrum for open and periodic systems. And when I have an open system, it's not that I am getting just what I had for the bulk plus my corner states, it's much more complicated. And I am going to show you that in this case, we can use a very beautiful concept, which is called the surrogate Hamiltonian. So if I have an open system, and I now do an analytical continuation of momentum into the imaginary axis to K plus I kappa. And now I write a Hamiltonian, which is the so-called surrogate Hamiltonian in terms of this complex momentum. I am able to get for this closed boundary conditions precisely the Hamiltonian that I have for the open boundary conditions just without the boundary modes. So the case here is going to be slightly more complicated and these no Hermitian systems, they exhibit a fascinating effect, which is the no Hermitian skin effect, where we get accumulation at the boundaries when we have open boundary conditions. If I have a system which is non-reciprocal and it is easier to hop in one direction, the electrons are going to accumulate at one corner of my system. Okay, and this is again a very interesting feature of this no Hermitian Hamiltonians. Okay, so where does it appear? Where do I get some no Hermitian Hamiltonian? 
to do to get this i need to have imaginary terms so this usually appears and we never think of it in that way in any interacting systems when i describe things in terms of quasi particles and i get a self energy i get an imaginary part there which is connected to the lifetime of my quasi particles this means that my energies are becoming complex right because it's not infinitely lived but finitely lived but we can also construct no reciprocal systems and these no reciprocal systems we can immediately get energies which are complex and where the the the, the hamiltonian then is not going to be uh, uh, h12 is different from the h21 so the system is now no hermitian oops um, what will happen is that in terms of the classification of the topological phases, this becomes much more complicated. This has been done. I refer you to those papers to look at the classification. And I want to focus here on the uh, thermodynamics. So to just try to set the, 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 the problem, I will look at the simplest possible case which is an, a sushrit higer model, but which is now no Hermitian. And if I take this one dimensional model and try to make it no Hermitian, so instead of hopping T and T2, now I have two options. One is to make these hoppings complex, such that let's say I would have T e2 i theta to go here and T e2 i theta instead of minus i theta when it comes back, which means making my hopping complex. But those ones don't obey certain symmetries and they don't show this uh, very interesting accumulation of modes at the edges. So I am going to consider one different type of model, which is just a model that has real hopping, but no reciprocal, which means when I hop from B to A, my hopping parameter is real, but it is T plus delta. And when I hop from A to B, is t minus delta, okay? So if delta would be zero, I would have the Hermitian case, but now it is easier to go to the left than it is to go to the right because the hopping is different in the two directions. So I write then the, the no Hermitian sushri figure Hamiltonian, it's just a hopping Hamiltonian, a tight binding one, very easy. And this is the so-called non-reciprocal version. And now, as a function of t and delta, uh, always written in, in unities of t2, we are, having to, we are going to have different phases. And the system is going to have a completely different phase diagram for different boundary conditions. So let's first then look at the energies. For the non-hermitian SSH, if I write my Hamiltonian as a d dot sigma, we are going to see that we have winding around exceptional points. And the exceptional point that was before at zero for the Hermitian case is splits into this red and this blue exceptional points here, given when the real part of dx is equal to my plus minus imaginary of dy, and the real of dy is plus minus imaginary of dx. And now my phase diagram in terms of the hopping t versus delta, delta is the no Hermitian parameter, if you remember, in unities of T2 equal one, is going to have several different phases. So look here when I go across this line and we are going to see all the different phases in terms of the winding numbers. If I am here, this is A, I have a winding which is not enclosing neither the blue nor the red in both of these winding numbers are zero. If I am at this point, now I am encircling one of the singular points, but not the other. I have zero and then one half for the winding numbers. If I am encircling both, I have one half and one half. And now I go into the point when these two, these two singularities are going to merge at zero. And then at this point, I recover the Hermitian case at the point where delta is equal to zero. 
and then they split again. I am at this point. I still have in, am in the phase one half, one half. And then I go into the phase one half is M0, where now I am encircling the blue singularity, but not the red, and zero, zero, when I'm not encircling any of them. Okay, so I have all this sequence of phases, and that phase here was the Hermitian topological phase, and this was the, 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 this, the Hermitian up here, the Hermitian zero. And now, in addition, I have those ones that are not Hermitian. Yes, there is a question, please. Do you read it, Maya? Yes. Uh, what defines exceptional points? Yes. So the exceptional points are the points at which I have the singularities. Before I had the singularity at the zero, and that's when I was calculating the winding. If I encircle the zero for the, the trivial, uh, for the, the, the normal SSH model, I would have that my winding number is one and I am in the topological phase. And if I don't encircle it, I would have the trivial phase. And now, my, because I now have real and imaginary parts for these exceptional points at which I have the singularity, this is, these points have split into two, okay? So now I will uh, look what happens. Uh, is it clear? I hope if it's not, please ask whatever again. So now I will calculate the, the spectrum when I have open boundary conditions instead of the periodic boundary conditions as I have here. If I have open boundary conditions, now I look at the real part of the energy as a function of delta. Delta is always the parameter that's giving me the non-hermeticity. And I will look first here, what happens for periodic boundary conditions on the upper line and for the open boundary conditions on the lower line. The first plot is for the real part of the energy here and here. The second plot is for the imaginary part of the energy. And the third is for the absolute value of the energy, okay? So what you can see here is that for the real part of the energy as a function of delta, uh, you are seeing that there, there is some kind of folding around uh, two here at one point something. For the imaginary, I had a gap in this part and then this gap is closing at this point, and from the absolute value, I see that precisely at this point where the gap was closing, I see a spike there. If I now look for the open boundary conditions, I see something extremely interesting. So you see for the small values of delta here, starting from delta equals zero, there was a gap. Then my gap has closed. I see a zero mode appearing in this interval, but, and then uh, the zero mode, there, there is a set of bands here, but I see also something very interesting there. In addition to the zero mode, I see that there are points here up and down where there is a collapse of all the bands. So if you think you are talking about fermions, suddenly I have a certain energy and all my fermions have the same energy. It's like for a flat band. I have this non-block band collapse. These are very interesting points. It's the equivalent of Bose-Einstein condensation, but for fermions. All my fermions are going into the same energy state. It's a very funny point. I also see here for the open boundary conditions that uh, I have here, a zero energy, and then suddenly I start opening for several values. So, and this is happening precisely at the point, uh, uh, one point something where I was getting this uh, collapse of all the energy bands. And this I can see also in the absolute value at this point there. So the spectrum for open boundary conditions is very rich. The real and the imaginary parts are complementary to each other. They are different, but they can see similar things happening. And now 
I can try to calculate what's the so-called surrogate Hamiltonian. So I make my K, I make an analytical continuation for my K where this kappa is defined in terms of T plus delta over T minus delta and log of that. And now I can then see that for the surrogate Hamiltonian, I see the similar behavior as I had for the, 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 the open boundary conditions with the difference that here I am not seeing the zero mode that I can see for the open boundary conditions. So the system with closed boundary conditions that I had been showing to you before, periodic boundary conditions, has a completely different spectrum than the one for the open. But if I calculate the surrogate Hamiltonian in terms of the complex K, then I get the same as for the open, except for the boundary modes, for the zero mode here, as we were used to get, okay? This is good to keep in mind. And this is now the, the phase diagram that was known from the Kavabata paper, T versus delta. This should be a topological phase uh, with uh, the, the winding number one, and this should be zero. So uh, Rodrigo has been and these are the points of the non block band collapse that I have been telling you that all the, the, the states have the same energy. So Rodrigo has been recalculating the Kavabata phase diagram and we have a much more detailed and precise phase diagram here. And now you can see that if delta is zero, where we, we had the Hermitian trivial phase and topological phase, what happens now is that even for delta no zero one and so on in this regime, we get a phase that is connected to the Hermitian trivial phase. And here also a phase that's connected to the Hermitian topological phase. But now there are more interesting phases, which is this no Hermitian trivial and this no Hermitian topological phases. And if we now, fix ourselves to be here at this value 1.1 for the, for the value of t over t, t2. And if you now look at the positive values of delta, because the same happens for the negative, we are going to have one phase transition, another phase transition, and a third phase transition. So there are three interesting phase transitions. One which is between the Hermitian trivial and the Hermitian topological one. We could imagine what should be happening here. This is a very interesting point because it's the point at which we have this no block band collapse is along these two transverse lines bringing us into the orange region. And this point here is fully between non-trivial topological, no Hermitian trivial and no Hermitian topological. And this is a completely new behavior also. And the question is, we probably should expect our thermodynamic description to hold here. What happens at the orange one here and at the transition between the orange and the green? So let's now think in terms of thermodynamics for no Hermitian systems. And you will tell me, what are you talking about? No Hermitian systems, if the Hamiltonian is not equal to its complex conjugate, this is usually describing open systems. But if it's an open system, it's not even in thermal equilibrium. How do you want to talk about thermodynamics? What does this mean to start with? And the, well, it's true and it's difficult, but Symmetries will save our lives. And there are two cases which are very interesting to consider. One is the case when our Hamiltonian ha has what is called a pseudo Hermitian symmetry. And now what happens is that in this case, the energies come in complex conjugated pairs. So when I sum over all of them, my partition function is, is still real. So I am in business. And the other case that is also quite nice is when I have parity time symmetry, because in this case, the energies are already completely real. So for these two kinds of cases, when I have this type of symmetries, 
I am in business because my partition function Z, my thermodynamic potential is going to be real. And I expect that things that I know from thermodynamics should hold. Let's see if this is true. So now we will look at things at zero temperature and uh, calculate the sum of the energies. Uh, but now these energies are going to be complex, right? So I could even have a complex mu and these energies are now complex and the sum of them are, is going to give me my thermodynamic potential. But I have to remember that I cannot use the regular thermodynamics. I have to use what is called the biorthogonal thermodynamics because now my delta MN is not the overlap of psi right with psi right or psi left with psi left, but the overlap between psi left and psi right. Okay. And we also have the, the, the problem that the thermodynamic limit could be well defined for open boundaries because the system be becomes unstable when I have an open system and I make it larger and larger. So let's start with the case of periodic boundary conditions when we have this phase diagram and we will look again at the energies. I know that I have a gap opening here in this regime for uh, delta is smaller than 0, 0,5 in the real axis. In the imaginary axis, I have a gap opening for delta larger than 1.5. So I would expect that I would get phase transitions every time when my gap is closing in the real and in the imaginary axis. And if I now take the bulk, the omega bulk, and I take derivatives with respect to delta, I will see a spike at 0, 0,5 where the real gap is closing and at 1.5 where the imaginary gap is closing. And now I take the second derivative and I see a very clear spike. So it looks like my derivative of my free energy as I did before is capturing these phase transitions. But now when I look at it, I say, this looks kind of odd, right? This is a true spike in the second derivative, but is this a spike or not? Doesn't look so clear, right? Before I didn't have something, either I have a very clearly well-defined spike. Here you say, mm, doesn't look so nice. Let's look at the scaling and at the critical exponents to be sure about it. So now when we look at how the gap is closing and we do the scaling analysis, you remember, I will look how my thermodynamic potential is going to scale as a function of G uh, at zero momentum. And what I will see now, I will first of all see that my critical exponent Z when I do this scaling for many orders of magnitude, how the gap is closing as a function of momentum by taking my g equals zero, I find that my critical exponent is no longer one, but it's one half. So the real part goes with modulus p to one half, the imaginary goes with modulus p to one half, and the modulus also does. And now when I look, how is my new z by taking momentum zero and seeing how my delta scales as a function of g, new z is one half, which means new is one. So instead of having the critical exponents one and one, now I have them to be one and one half. And when I put them into the Josephson hyperscaling relation, it means that the order of my phase transition is 1.5. That's why when I look at that one here at the first derivative, I was not so sure that whether I had really a phase transition or not, I should have looked at a fractional derivative with order 1.5. I will tell you something about fractional derivatives if you ask me a question when I come at the end, okay? So we have now a different critical exponent, which is this one half for the Z. It's already something different. There is also Something uh, more interesting that Rodrigo has been showing here in this paper is that now 
the universality class that I have, it's the no Hermitian Dirac model universality class where this beta and this alpha are no Hermitian. So before I had everything belonging to the Hermitian Dirac universality class, now it belongs to the no Hermitian Dirac universality class, okay? And I can still understand the phase transition in terms of thermodynamics, but with a, a richer type of problem. Now let's look at what happens when I have open boundary conditions. For open boundary conditions, we have these points where we have the non-block band collapse that are very interesting points. In addition to these points where we have the gap closing, right? So now, I have this phase diagram and let's look what happens at these three phase transitions here. So the first one from the Hermitian trivial to the Hermitian topological, which is that one here, I am representing it here uh, for the zero chemical potential in blue and in green. The blue one is for the extensive part and for the green one is for the non-extensive part basically bulk and boundary. So I immediately see that for the first derivative of omega, for the green, for the no expense extensive, I am seeing a jump at 0 0.5 and a spike at 1.5. So this is a first order phase transition for the edge. And for the blue, I have here is difficult to see, but there is a, a little, uh, a, a very little kink and here also looks like a little kink. And actually, I need to go to the second derivative to see the spike. It is a second order phase transition. So it's precisely what we knew from the Hermitian models. First order for the edge, second order for the bulk. OK? But now, when I look for mu equal minus 1, I am trying to look at this phase transition here. I will see that for mu equal minus one, for the extensive and for the no extensive contributions, I'm seeing a spike is here when delta is equal to this value, which is precisely at the non-block band collapse that is here, okay? So now it doesn't look like it's the same derivative, the first derivative. It doesn't look like that bulk and edges are behaving differently. They are behaving equally. It's a very strange thing, very strange feature. And what we can do, we can go into the periodic system using the surrogate Hamiltonian for which we do the analytic continuation in momentum. And I can now look at this orange one and I will see again the same spike for my surrogate Hamiltonian as I was seeing here for the orange. So things, things seem to be consistent. But we need to look now at the scaling to try to understand further what's going on here and here for these novel phase transitions. So let's now look at the transition from the Hermitian trivial to topological and at the phase transition from the no Hermitian trivial to topological. One is represented in red, the other is represented in blue. Okay, so for the red one, I had precisely what I had before when I look at the scaling of my gap as a function of P or at the scaling of my gap as a function of G for several orders of magnitude, I get my critical exponents. Z is one, nu is one. I am in the Hermitian Dirac universality class for, the, this, for this phase transition. The order of the phase transition is D plus one. It's first order for the edge it is second order for the bulk, as before. But if I am at the blue point, now my z is one half, my mu is one, my order of my phase transition is 1.5, I am in the Dirac, no Hermitian Dirac universality class, and the order of my phase transition is 1.5 for the bulk. And I can also, if I look as a function of G very closely, what I can see is that the singular part of my uh, uh, free energy 
is changing from one into one half as I approach the phase transition, which is at zero. So only very close to the critical point, I will see that this critical exponent is one half. If I look further away, I have the impression it's one. But as I approach the phase transition, I see that it becomes one half, okay? So that is something different that we have for uh, the, 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 the no Hermitian models. So the, the red one is in the Hermitian Dirac model universality class. This is for the no Hermitian Dirac model universality class with this complex coefficients alpha and beta that I have shown you in the previous slide. But the, 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 this hyperscaling relation keeps holding for both. It's just that I get a different number here, but it still holds. But now let's look at this one here, at this non-block band collapse. Now for the scaling at this non-block band collapse, everything becomes a mess. So there is no scaling with P. If we try to calculate the correlation length by looking at the, 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 the correlations between C, C daga I and C daga and C I plus R, I see something very strange. My correlation length is coming to zero as a function of G at the point of the phase transition instead of diverging. So things are getting localized at the boundaries instead of extending everywhere when I have S when I have a critical system. So it is a very different behavior than I have in any critical system. It's very special. And there is a new lengthy scale that is going to be associated to the imaginary part of K. And this is this so-called due to the no, so-called no Hermitian skin effect. So I have a skin length scale that's coming in. And now for this phase transition, the Josephson hyperscaling relation breaks down. It does not work. So you can see here that I had my new Z equal to one half and two minus alpha being one half in my uh, omega s is one half. So the scaling in terms of g seems to be going with an exponent one half, but mu is ill-defined. I cannot define any longer my uh, Josephson hyperscaling relation at this point. It's a completely novel point. And at this point, the extensive, the boundary and the bulk they have the same scaling as you can see in orange and in, in pink. So it's a completely new type of phase transition. So let me come to my concluding remarks because it is time. So I have been telling you that no Hermitian systems can lead to very interesting and new phenomena. We can use a thermodynamic description if we have the appropriate symmetries and we can still have a real partition function to attempt to describe these systems using thermodynamics. We are going to, we have seen that the no Hermitian systems have a different universality class with respect to their Hermitian counterpart and that at the non block band collapse, all the scaling laws break down because we introduce the new length scale for these open boundary conditions. So uh, with this, I conclude the talk. I would like to show you the pictures of the heroes who have been doing this work. So both papers for the non Hermitian model and for the, the Hotchis were done by Rodrigo Aroca. He is the main author in both of them. The Hotchis were done uh, in collaboration with the Sander, and the No Hermitian was done in collaboration with uh, Ching Wali. I would like to thank both of them, and now I would like to take your questions. I first listen to the questions, and afterwards I will show you my next slide for the question we already had. Uh, okay, there is one question. Uh, Mikel Garcia needs to ask about the fractional derivatives. Yes, how are the fractional derivatives? So um, we have been studying 
we have been learning in, 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 at the university, just first and second derivatives, right? But you can wonder why, has the, why does it need to be integer? Why can't I have a derivative 0 0.3 or 1.4? In principle, we could. So there has been, uh, the mathematicians have been thinking about that already for long. Many of them, Riemann, Weil, uh, um, a, a series of mathematicians. And it was extremely complicated because then you will get things that are completely counterintuitive. The derivative of a constant will become a function. Uh, the derivative of the exponential is no longer an exponential. So we started studying this problem recently and there is a paper that was published the last year or this year, I don't know anymore, uh, in, in PRB letters. Uh, you will, we, we, we were looking at a fractional derivative of the Langevin equation where the friction term is no longer a first derivative but it could be any derivative, which is no integer. And uh, it's extremely interesting because just by changing the number of the derivative, we show that we can, with the same model, describe many different phases of matter, liquid glass, anomalous glass, the Gardner phase, and even describe a, 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 a time glass phase by simply changing the derivatives. So if you go to this paper, which is on archive, if you look for my name, you will find the fractional derivative of the Langevin equation. In the supplementary information, we have a very long description of the history of fractional derivatives and how we could then tackle physical problems only when we got the Caputo version of it because now it gives us boundary conditions in terms of integer derivatives. There are different ways how you can do. You can get uh, 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 several references to even books in our paper there. I invite you to go there. And if you would like to discuss further, please just drop me an email. I can talk to you further about fractional derivatives because it's a topic we are currently investigating in the group and we want, we want to go on with it. It enlarges enormously our perspectives in physics. Thanks for the question. Are there more questions? Uh, I, have a, I have a question. Yes. Um, so the neural emission systems you studied had a real spectrum. And yes. uh, uh, I think there's, I mean, I think most of, if not all of the neural emission systems that have a real spectrum can be mapped to a Hermitian system by ah, some uh, transformation. Uh, okay, so let me, oh, this is a very good question, thank you. I didn't consider the ones that have a, Hermit, a, a real spectrum. I consider the ones that have pairs of complex conjugate energies, okay? The, the energies are complex, but they come in complex conjugated pairs. So when you sum over all of them, the imaginary part disappears for the free energy, but the energy is too complex. Is it particle hole dagger or something? Yeah, the... so yeah, so this is the, the, the one I had shown you here. Okay, okay. sorry, so then I, I missed Yeah, the that is this. Yeah. You see, it's the pseudo Hermitian. Yeah, yeah. And the SSH model, which is non-reciprocal, is precisely pseudo Hermitian. So mm. I still have complex energies, but the Z is real. That's the trick. For the other one, it is if the energies are real, then it's simpler, of course. Right, and right. you can see that here, I had a, a phase. I have these phases, which are the no Hermitian trivial and the no Hermitian topological. They are not connected to the Hermitian trivial mm, to the Hermitian yeah, topological. Right. So I have genuine new no Hermitian topological phases. And that's why I have here a genuine new universality class, which is the no Hermitian Dirac universality class, okay? So it is important to understand that uh, I, I am still within a, a rather closed set of models for which I can think of a, a, a thermodynamic description, but I am capturing features that are beyond the Hermitian ones. 
And especially I'm capturing that non-block band collapse, which is extremely interesting because it doesn't obey scaling laws like the Josephson hyperscaling relation. Is it clear that the answer to your question? Uh, yeah, thank you. Sorry, I got this earlier on some phone call. <laughs> yeah, yes. yeah, it's clear. Okay, um, are there more questions? So if not, I have to go, yeah, uh, there is more, but let me just go to the question that we had in the beginning, because I promised I would show how the, 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 the Vanier, spe oops, sorry, how the Vanier spectrum is uh, uh, constructed. So you will construct the, the Wilson loop in that way by going uh, from the, U, the overlaps of the UNKIs with plus delta K up to the k minus delta k, you will close your large Wilson loop. Uh, you will have to use uh, this SU of m matrices where the m are the number of the occupied bands. Your delta k's are defined here. And out of this, you can define then your Vanier spectrum. And once you have your Vanier spectrum, your Hamiltonian is such that you have the Vanier centers as the eigenstate, as the eigenvalues of your Hamiltonian. And once you have the, the Vanier spectrum, you can define the, the Vanier uh, um, thermodynamic potential by summing over the, the Vanier eigenstates. Maybe uh, the best would be to go also to the paper and uh, take a look. And if you still have any question, uh, you, you could talk to Rodrigo or to me just drop us an email. Maybe this uh, would help you to understand the one who had this question before. And apparently there is one there more. There is one more question if you have yes. time. Okay, sure. this is the last one for the rest of the attendees. Please write on Slack. So Isidora Araya Day says, I am not sure whether this was mentioned, but is what? it possible? Uh, sorry, I didn't hear. I am not sure whether this was mentioned, but is it possible to somehow include disorder in this thermodynamic approach? Ah, oh, we didn't until now. I don't know. I don't know. It was not mentioned at all and I didn't even think of it until now. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Can I make yes. a compliment on that? Yeah, because in principle, in principle we, we can, because uh, we can compute the, the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian in both real space or in momentum in space. So if you add this order, you can model it in the Hamiltonian. And in principle, we can, you can, use, we can see the effect of this in the thermodynamics in, this, in the same way. So yes, but they're not, uh, not in K space, but going into real space, exactly, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah only doing but the then everywhere where, where we had, where we were using, these mappings that we just calculate things for the, the periodic boundary conditions and subtract, then you, you don't do it in case space any longer. It, it could be a bit more intricate. Yes, but thank you, Rodrigo. In principle, if you go into real space, you, I think you are right, one could. One, to, one could try to do that. Okay, so there is one comment as also oh, you don't rely on the translational symmetry and uh, please the next question on Slack. The next prep question is what? No, no, no. <laughs> if they have more questions, they should write ah. it on Slack because we are very late. Ah, okay, yes. So, yeah, so if you have more questions, please just send me an email. Yeah, well, the last one was that you don't rely on translational symmetry. This is what she asked. Uh, well, when we are, we have translational symmetry when we are calculating, for instance, things in terms of K for the bulk, we are. We are relying when we are calculating for periodic boundary conditions. When you have then the, the, the open boundary condition system, no, you are not. We can calculate things for open boundary conditions. But then to extract the, 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 the parts we are interested, like the edge or the corner, we usually use this correlation function, subtracting the ones for the bulk, for which we are relying on, on, on translational symmetry from the other ones. 
And that's why we had to define the surrogate Hamiltonian for the, the, the non Hermitian one. So we don't need to rely on translational symmetry. We can calculate things using scaling, which will not rely on translational symmetry, but it might be much more costly in terms of time. We, when we can rely, we do, because this uh, makes our life easier. But strictly speaking, we don't need to rely. Okay, all yeah. right. Thank you very much for these two wonderful lectures, Christiane, and I hope I will see you in San Sebastian. Yes, I hope okay. to see you in San Sebastian sometime. Thank you very <laughs> much, everyone. And uh, for the rest, we will reconvene for the last uh, lecture talk uh, at uh, 10 past with uh, Sami Mitra, the editor of uh, Physical Review Letters. See you soon. Bye. Bye.